Thank you very much, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. You'll notice the little French accent that I have. It's real. I am from <laughs> France. <laughs> People told me a long time ago, you know, with a French accent, you can be more successful in the U.S. And uh, <laughs> I'm working very hard not to lose it. It's working. But I have been uh, in the United States for quite a while now, and I have been doing orthopedics. And a long time ago, I noticed that we were maybe, as orthopedic surgeons, less than uh, thorough, if you want, or complete about the management of our patients. This is uh, regarding patients that show up on uh, three legs with, you know, some severe patellar luxation, or cruciate, or hip disease, and. You know, you learn to do surgery, which is, you know, technical, and it's nice to do a good surgery, but it's nowhere sufficient uh, for the patient. You know, we, we then we say, good luck, or this is our discharge instructions. There used to be six lines of text, and yet we have this complex situation. So I think that's very important for us to look at patients that are impaired a lot more thoroughly, if you want, or looking at really what the owner needs from us rather than, you know, just doing a good surgery. And the same applies to osteoarthritis. I can't think of any topic that's more important in the life of dogs, particularly big dogs. You're thinking about, you know, many people have these big shepherd mix dogs and labs and golden and they have osteoarthritis. We'll see the numbers during the lecture it's, it's incredibly common to have osteoarthritis. In fact, it's so common that most people think that it's totally expected for an older dog to have osteoarthritis or to stop moving or to die from it. If we look at the research, you know, the lack of mobility because of an orthopedic disease, particularly osteoarthritis, is in, in a big lifelong study was the most common reason for dogs to die. It kills more dogs in, in my universe than any other disease, really than any other disease combined, the loss of mobility. And so we need to work more on osteoarthritis, understand it better, and I'll talk to you about it for you know, this first lecture. I was given this topic, I found it extremely interesting and important. Uh, what is the deal? Are we dealing with inflammation of joints or degeneration of joints? And this entire lecture is going to be dancing around that question, if you want, because it's obviously a very hard question and not a question that's been covered in a lot of papers. So I did my best, this is a new lecture, new notes, to talk to you as completely as possible about the relationship of inflammation, degeneration in, in our patients, in the dogs that we deal with. I uh, lecture for a number of uh, companies, and I do research for a number of orga organizations. None of those things should interfere with what we discuss we're discussing this morning. I do thank Hills very much and very si sincerely for including osteoarthritis in this uh, lecture. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for you to be thinking about it. I'm, I'm planting seeds in your mind about the importance of osteoarthritis. And you're looking at this arthritic hip, and on radiographs, it would look like an arthritic hip, like you see uh, three, five of them a week, and you say this dog has osteoarthritis. But think about your own hip joint, and think about this joint that has been completely transformed by osteoarthritis. And think about this dog living with that abnormal joint for six years before that thing is discovered. And you're wondering, you know, are we really practicing medicine? Are we in a modern era where we understand things quickly, this dog has had this transformation occurring for six years. He's been at the vet for 20 times during his life, and yet no one has picked up this joint. This is, you know, this is what is happening these days in orthopedics. And so of, along the way, we're going to be asking ourselves how we can do a better job, maybe picking that up earlier in the cycle, if you want. And to start this discussion, we've got to talk about really what triggers osteoarthritis in dogs. Um, and then we'll review the specific disease that causes that osteoarthritis. We'll look at how inflammatory or how degenerative these, these most common diseases are in dogs. And then we'll put everything together in a few minutes at the end. 
So this is a recent human review, but the process is the same in our dogs. And this was kind of the key table in that review. And you can see uh, two lists there of things that cause osteoarthritis. We have obesity and trauma, malalignment, joint instability, and abnormal anatomy. It's a long list on the left. And then we have a lo another long list on the right, inflammation, aging, sepsis, genetic factors, and immune responses. So we are going to you know, incorporate that into our thinking in dogs. Obviously, all these things then kind of interact with each other. As you can imagine, if you have uh, abnormal anatomy, you are going to damage your joint. You're going to create destruction of the joint and pain, and you'll behave differently, you'll use your leg differently, you will inf it will influence, further influence your joint. The inflammation created by that abnormal anatomy itself will break the joint down. In fact, that's why it's so hard to understand and to, to even cover the question that we have here is because if we wait three months, six months or a year, we're looking at a completely different disease. We're looking at the very long-term consequence of something that triggered osteoarthritis. And to understand it well, we would have to kind of look at it a little bit earlier in the cycle. So we'll start. This is an interactive session, and this is going to be the first question that we have to answer. And it relates to the two lists that we just saw. What is the most common cause of osteoarthritis in dogs? Is it obesity? Is it trauma? Is it sepsis? Is it joint instability or subluxation? Or is it an immune response problem? This is a difficult question, but let's see what we have here. You guys remember how to vote, know how to vote? I give you a little time. You know? We got five votes. Six. Teach your neighbor, please. <laughs> <laughs> if you voted, influence your neighbor. I've heard one time, vote early and often. I give you another 10 seconds. There'll be other questions after that. We got 30 votes. All right. So we have 44 votes, and obesity comes first, and joint uh, subluxation is second, and the answer is joint instability or subluxation, with the idea that the trigger, and you know, you could say, well, this question was unclear because obesity does promote degenerative joint disease, but obesity is not as much of a trigger of degenerative joint disease as joint subluxation and joint instability, and you'll see that very soon when we describe the orthopedic diseases. So malalignment and joint instability are going to be the trigger of joint disease in our patient most often. We'll get back to it. Inflammation, of course, is present with this disease, with some more than others, and we'll also see how common that is a bit later on. So these days we do arthroscopy, we're looking in joints. I'm always amazed to see that. I know a little bit more about you know, the morphology of a joint by looking inside joints. This is an elbow joint. And when we look at that elbow, we see those two things. We can't really answer that question completely. We see on the left, what do we see? A lot of hyperemia. This is a joint capsule of a young dog's elbow that has subluxation and there's quite a bit of subluxation in this elbow, and I see a joint that has a lot of new blood vessels that's all red, that's completely angry with inflammation. I also see an articular cartilage that's not used very well and very much there. 
On the right side of this image, we're looking at articular cartilage that looks completely abnormal in this young dog, and we have abnormal cartilage. We're not really answering the question here. Both inflammation and degeneration are present in this dog. Looking at a different dog, this is a pretty good-looking uh, shoulder in another young dog. This dog is eight months old, a great Pyrenees, and he has this uh, shoulder that has a lesion. That's an OCD lesion on the back of the humeral head, and when we look inside this joint, we see both degeneration. This is obviously focal. Part of his articular cartilage is, looks like it's it has exploded. It's completely irregular. There is exposed subchondral bone. It's very kind of ugly looking. But there is also inflammation in the joint. This is his bicipital tendon. And you see, again, the joint is so angry, and the tendon is angry, and there are new blood vessels. You're not supposed to have panus, these blood vessels growing on that tendon. And, sh and sure enough, that tendon is very painful and inflamed also. And once again, we have degeneration and inflammation coexisting in that particular joint. How do we scientifically judge uh, those things? This is my only scientific slides. I don't particularly love them, but we will try to stick with real-life discussions. But we can measure things that are ref a reflection of inflammation, like cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase in the joint capsule, and in, in subcontrol bone, for example, or, car or homogenized cartilage. And we've done that study at NC State where we looked at tissues in total hip patients. Total hip patients give us the opportunity to collect some of the tissue that would otherwise be discarded. So we found that cyclooxygenase is expressed a lot in the joint capsule. And this is cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2. And COX-1, COX-2, and lipooxygenase are upregulated in the subchondral bone, telling you that there is an inflammatory component to uh, hip dysplasia in our patients that undergo total hip. We find a lot of upregulation of uh, metabolites or enzymes related to inflammation. And so for cartilage degeneration, we would proceed the same way, but often we do that histologically. Mark, we could collect joint fluid in a patient. That's not a very good uh, assessment of cartilage degeneration. The problem with assessing degeneration is that often it's an invasive process that we can't really do in our clinical patients. But we know in research we can grade cartilage or measure components of cartilage, and we can see degeneration in that particular cartilage. We have more information in research than we have clinically. Often, we've got to basically look at cartilage, assess clinical damage to judge degeneration. So degeneration is uh, sometimes, here is a cruciate. The cruciate will come up in our discussion. This is a, um, a cruciate disease. This is a picture of a cruciate ligament that looks completely shredded, yet the cartilage is very healthy at that stage, but the edge of the joint is uh, not particularly happy. Again, we see new blood vessels. We see osteophytes being born there. This is a very interesting picture from a cruciate patient. Again, the cartilage was still healthy, but osteophytes were forming at the edge of the cartilage. And so what we'll do in this presentation and what you'll see in more detail in your notes is that we'll try to give a little bit of a uh, somewhat subjective assessment about how inflamed the joint is with a specific disease and how uh, degenerative the cartilage of the joint is with the same disease. And I'll ask you a few questions. We'll see if we agree on these diseases along the way. We could develop a little bit of an index if you want, see how inflammatory things are and how degenerative things are and we will be uh, talking about that a little bit. So what are the specific causes of osteoarthritis? Um, and so now we're talking about specific disease. Just to uh, show everybody, you go to the agenda, then go to the topic that is in the agenda, and then you hit polls. And then you can... That's the way how to do it. All 
articular fractures, OCD, hip dysplasia, Perthes disease, and elbow dysplasia. We got a few more votes this time. Better participation. When I was a young kid, I lived in Belgium, and in Belgium they found a solution to voting. It's mandatory. Yes. <laughs> participation rate, 95%. If you don't vote, you get a fine. Great. So we, we hit 100. I'll stop at 100. Four more people, please. There we go. Thank you. So we got hip dysplasia at 78%, and we got a little bit of OCD and a bit of an articular fracture. Not much for the other two. Great. Let's see what we got. Um, the most common is hip dysplasia. You guys are completely correct. And I rank things for most likely to least likely as hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, which you notice you guys tend to underestimate, then OCD, articular fracture, and Perthes disease. It's very good to know. Now look at these two dogs. They both are the same age, similar breeds, and yet they look very different, don't they? The one on the top you're not feeling too bad about. He has hip dysplasia, and he's had it for years. The one on the bottom, you, you, you don't need to be an orthopedic surgeon to, to see the severity of the problem. He has a cruciate disease. So here we have two dogs of the, that both have maybe about similarly messed up joints. In fact, the cruciate dog has newer problem than the hip dog, but a much more inflammatory problem, a much more debilitating problem. So you see a more inflammatory disease in the cruciate patient here, more debilitating than in the hip dysplasia patient at the top. They will come back in our conversation. So which one of these problems, let's talk about uh, how inflammatory they are here. Are we going to have uh, another quick question, partial, uh, which uh, of these common problems is the least inflammatory? And we have partial cruciate tear, OCD, hip dysplasia, Perthes disease, and elbow dysplasia. I know it's completely new thinking for you. We got our... Everybody is. You're doing much better with that voting thing. <laughs> it's like Congress. <laughs> it's working very smoothly. <laughs> All right. Ooh, Perthes disease, least inflammatory, 102. So it's a bit more balanced there. Maybe we haven't been thinking about that a lot. We got. The least inflammatory disease, we got the winner here is Perthes disease, followed by hip dysplasia, and then OCD. Okay, I'm going to move on. And we have the most, the least inflammatory problem is hip dysplasia also. It's a big star, and you saw that dog was working fairly well. And all the other problems are quite inflammatory partial cruciate, OCD, Perthes disease, and, and uh, elbow dysplasia. And I'm going to tell you about Perthes disease. First, you know, it happens very young dog. It starts around five months of age. It's most often in a single hip versus hip dysplasia that's on both hips. But we diagnose it very early because dogs are often on three legs. They're little dogs. It doesn't matter if they're little or big. They are very, very lame from it. They, they feel very painful, and they rarely, we don't treat Perthes disease conservatively because little dogs often end up on three legs and, and completely refuse to use their leg. So we are more aggressive treating Perthes disease than hip dysplasia. Many dogs with hip dysplasia are going to be okay without any dramatic thing happening very early in life, but Perthes disease dogs are not because they hurt a lot. And it's not a morphologic thing. So we won't spend a huge amount of time in this, but I want you to know that in your notes, please read them you will see how inflammatory these uh, common causes are. We're going to go over them a little bit. And you also will talk about how the degeneration, how much degeneration, and you'll see that for all these common orthopedic diseases in your notes. So let's go over maybe one to three causes, the most common causes for the six main joints that we deal with. 
we can't really answer the question about inflammation or degeneration in a general sense. As you saw already, hip, elbow, knee are very different from each other, so we're going to look at them individually. And we'll start with hip dysplasia, since it's, we've seen the most common disease. And we can conclude that it's the most common disease from one big study that had 100,000 orthopedic patients that were looked at, and about 10% of all cases, orthopedic cases seen by this uh, group of uh, specialty practices was uh, dogs with hip dysplasia. And we know from another big study that uh, Newfoundland and St. Bernard are more likely to have hip dysplasia. We don't have a lot of large epidemiologic studies, but that's one that tells us that Newfies and St. Bernard are more messed up than other breeds, um, in case you didn't know. And hip dysplasia is, you know, as we saw earlier, it starts with subluxation. It's a laxity problem. You have tight hips. In some way, you could eat poorly if you had tight hips, and you'd be better off. But if you have loose hips, then you should watch out and be very, very careful about what you do. We know that dogs with laxity in their hips that are a little bit overweight will accelerate the demise of their hips very, very much so. So this is what kind of end-stage hip disease looks like. It has a transient inflammation. Hip dysplasia is slightly inflammatory early in life. This is before you're of age as the process kind of starts. But then later on, it's more of a degeneration process, and we see severe changes over time. You can see a femoral head here that's completely lost all its cartilage, and uh, we are looking at exposed subcontrol bone that looks like ivory, and then we're looking at an acetabulum that's highly transformed. Now, not every dog will get to that stage. Some get to that stage very slowly over time. A number of factors influence the speed of progression of osteoarthritis, and I also discussed that in your notes. So let's talk about hip dysplasia here from a functional perspective. How many dysplastic dogs uh, show moderate to severe lameness. Is that less than a quarter, a quarter to a half, a half to three quarter, or more than three quarter? Ooh, you're doing very well now. Voting very quickly. I can see a fight between the less than a quarter and it's time to react. 106 votes, 112. And the winner is less than a quarter. I really like uh, this. That is the correct answer. In fact, there are uh, two studies that really looked at that. There was an old British study that found Roughly uh, about 24%. That's a sneaky result because it's less than 25. <laughs> but I, sorry. But then I, I, I did a study at NC State. We looked at the association of exercise and lameness and, and joint motion in Labradors with hip dysplasia that had not had surgery. They were just lab with hip dysplasia and published that in JAVMA a couple of years ago. And we found that 94% of the Labrador retrievers had no visible sign of lameness or had mild sign of lameness, and we described that very specifically in the paper. So most of the dogs with hip dysplasia were functioning quite well. They didn't need something drastic done just because they had osteoarthritis. Great. So the stifle joint is second on that list. About 8% of orthopedic cases seem to be cruciates. And in, another, in that same epidemiologic study, new fees, again, new fees, uh, Rottweilers and Labrador Retrievers were at, statistically, they were at incre increased risk of that compared to all dogs combined. And that increase was like fourfold roughly uh, for the new fees and the Rottweiler and about two and a half fold for Labrador Retrievers. So a lot of dogs have cruciate disease it's very debilitating because it's highly inflammatory. It, it has a profound impact on these dogs. And it ends up being the most common surgery done by people who do surgery for a living because it's so debilitating. 
The style for uh, the cruciate disease is therefore highly inflammatory. This is an old picture. We don't open joints like that now, but you can see the joint capsule has become very thick. There are little blood vessels. Once again, these blood vessels are invading the joint as a sign of active inflammation. It's a very angry and painful joint. Cartilage is also gnarly looking. The degeneration follows that uh, chronic inflammation. We also have patella, and interestingly in the styphor, while the cruciate is highly inflammatory and very debilitating, the patella is completely non-inflammatory. It's also very common, about 6% of orthopedic cases, but we don't see a lot of uh, inflammation. We only see degeneration in the area that has a mechanical problem, the trochlea or the patella itself, but the rest of the joint is pretty healthy. It's a dog with chronic patellar luxation with very good looking cartilage and uh, that's the dog you see right there. So patellar luxation common but not inflammatory. We'll see a little bit of degeneration. Sometimes we'll see though the exception to the rule. We'll see, and you can see, look at that region right here. It's very angry looking, a lot of changes and a very painful dog. Some patellar luxation patients are very painful. This one that had a very high patella that would kind of get stuck above the joint was very painful, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Moving down, the tarsus, not a lot to say. Probably statistically, you know, they are very uncommon compared to the knee and the hip, less than a percent. But probably what we see will be little injuries in the joint, such as this one right here, and you can see there is a small chip of bone, which is an evulsion of the collateral ligament. We'll see that in sporting dogs. And it's small. If you don't magnify things or look carefully, you'll miss it. So often we'll see the chronic consequences of these evulsions, which is basically a small articular fracture in the joint. And then it's going to be chronic inflammation, not a lot of degeneration. We'll also see OCD in the joint, so we'll have a joint that will have a flap of cartilage uh, on the talus in this case. And again, we'll see uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. Sometimes we'll have to use our CT scan, which we use quite a bit these days, to diagnose these problems early, not to wait. The thing I dislike the most in orthopedics is thinking, let's just wait three months and see how messed up this joint is so we'll know more about it. You can see, that's still done these days. It's done in puppies, which is even worse to do it in puppies. And so we do these CT scans, we see the problem, we can tackle it much better when we diagnose it acutely. We'll see some trauma. We've, we haven't talked too much about trauma because in the big scheme of things, that's not really a, a common cause of degenerative joint disease. And so we'll see dislocation. Um, and usually that's not particularly damageful to the joint if it's addressed quickly. So in the shoulder, the shoulder is still a bit of a mystery joint. Degenerative joint disease is very common. In the big lifelong studies with Labradors, uh, the ones that were a little bit heavy by eight years of age, 19 of, of 22 shoulders had uh, degenerative joint disease by eight years of age for no known reasons. In fact, their skinny brothers and sisters, 12 of, of 21, two-thirds roughly of their shoulders had degenerative joint disease by eight years of age. It's a bit of a mystery. Some people are working and trying to understand. I think it's a form of instability probably, but we need to do more research to understand that better. The elbow, very common joint also. I think the second most common in what I said earlier, even though it's not as known, and it's elbow dysplasia, which is also a form of subluxation, just like hip dysplasia. That's why subluxation is the most common source of osteoarthritis. And we don't know, um, actually I'm gonna go back there, we don't know whether that subluxation is, you know, we don't know all the details of where it comes from. Why do Labradors, Labradors look like normal dogs. Why is their elbow not growing properly? We understand if we work with the Basset Hound, or some Shih Tzu, some little-legged dogs, that their elbow might not fit very well because they have very short legs. Their legs should have been longer. The body gets confused when legs don't grow. You know, <laughs> it's fine in the middle of the bone. The middle of the bone is very happy. It doesn't care, really. It says, oh, the elbow is a little closer than it should be. And the wrist is, 
but the joints get really confused, especially if three bones are trying to articulate in some fancy way. So there's a lot of elbow dysplasia that's really obviously the consequence of being a short-legged dog, being a chondrodystrophic breed, and there are so many dwarf dogs. I mean, we love them. I saw a lot of them. I went jogging last night. I saw, I saw uh, a lot of short-legged dogs, and you know, my, many of them have elbow osteoarthritis, elbow degenerative joint disease. So it's very common in the elbow. In fact, if you look at the OFA, about 16% of dogs that have submitted radiographs for the elbow among the top 50 breeds with elbow dysplasia, 16% of them, that's 180,000 dogs that they have diagnosed with elbow dysplasia, it's very common. That's a dog in six. So in the wrist, we are not going to see a lot of degenerative joint disease. We'll see some hyperextension injuries. Some are developmental, like this little German Shepherd. Some of them grow out of it. Uh, generally, it gets better as they grow. Some of them have little fractures in the joint. Again, pretty unusual, a little bit like the ankle we'll see bones that are either incompletely ossified or little slab fracture. Altogether, again, very uncommon compared to what we deal with in the hip, the elbow, and the knee. So we're not going to worry too much about the carpus. But we are, we are worried, as I mentioned earlier, about the clinical consequences of degenerative joint disease. They are very profound, and we are not always paying very close attention to these dogs uh, that have these early signs. I have a young dog here that shows up. It's a St. Bernard. His ankles are obviously pointing in the wrong direction, like people say. You know, he has backwards ankle. Like, I'm trying to open the book and look for that, because I missed it during my residency. We didn't talk about pointing in the wrong direction. You try to figure it out. And this actually, these ankles are just about normal, they just extend a little bit too much. And if you think about how an ankle is put together, it's pretty easy for it to be stretched in extension. That's what the ballerinas do, in part, as they go on point. And this dog is on point. This dog's main problem is in his hips. This dog has a lot of hip pain. As a result of his hip pain, this dog has been shifting weight forward, and then now he has stretched his ankle as a result of that. Now, sadly, the dog comes to see me because his ankles are abnormal and everybody has missed his hip pain. It's, it's incredible that this dog has been so painful that it changed his body and yet it flew under the radar and only because he messed up his ankles we discover his hip pain. This other dog also has hip pain and you see he can't get up anymore. He's older and later in the stages of the disease he had a little bit too much to eat also, and now he's paying the price. And now they come to see me. They shouldn't come right now. They should have come much earlier, and we would have done a much better job much more easily with this guy. So the consequences of osteoarthritis, which is all that what we're interested in for these patients, are going to be very different for owners. Owners are going to be interested in what dogs can't do or can no longer do whether they, they scream, they're very obsessed about screaming. We, I don't know what it, ha it has to do in the big scheme of things with how messed up the joint is, but if the dog screams, then we must do surgery the following day. <laughs> and it's, it's really silly. Activity level, playfulness, I'm no, now as a clinician, I'm going to be interested in posture, maybe joint effusion, maybe crepitus that I can detect on palpation, joint instability I can measure or assess. And as a researcher, I'm going to be interested in weight distribution, in serum concentrations of markers of joint disease, maybe histologic changes. You can see the three different languages spoken by the owner, the clinician, and the researcher in understanding osteoarthritis, part of the reason why we haven't made more progress. All this is also in your notes. So importantly for us also, we're going to have to put things in perspective and notice that Large breed dogs are going to be more severely impacted by osteoarthritis. The little dog that has an arthritic limb will still stay quite mobile because it's easier for a little dog to move than a big dog. We're going to have to look at the, the size of the osteophytes, even though that correlates very poorly with the clinical consequences of osteoarthritis. We're going to have to look at the extent of the joint damage based on what we know about each disease. We're going to have to look at how chronic the situation is. As you know, chronic pain is a very different situation from acute pain. 
and in osteoarthritis, above any other disease, it's very important to treat chronic situations very differently from acute situations. They are much more deeply rooted. They have consequences on joint motion, on weight distributions, on behavior that are harder to tackle. That's a real motivation for treating things, for staying on top of things, and discovering things earlier and treating them better, managing them better. Also, we've got to look in the big scheme of things why these joints reacting differently. It probably comes from the relative position of a bone in relation to another. Some joints are very tight, like an elbow. There is not much room for the articular surface to be away from each other, and when they are inflamed, they hurt a lot. Some joints are looser, like the, the, the um, shoulder or the hip, and they tolerate uh, changes in the cartilage much better because there is less of an intimate contact. Also, some joints are used in the middle of their range. You're thinking about a hip. It can flex a lot and extend a lot past where it's used. And those are more forgiving situations, but some joints are used very close to full extension. Think about an elbow, maybe, or a wrist. If, hip, if, if elbow extension hurts, then you're going to have a hard time walking. And often, a lot of the pain from osteoarthritis that comes from the joint capsule is only going to occur in the last 10 degrees or so of joint motion. And so, again, joints are not all equal because the ones that are going to be used in, very st in stretch position are going to be more painful. All these things have to be integrated in what we think of osteoarthritis. So it's very important for us to, under to understand that osteoarthritis has a very different impact on joints on dogs over a lifetime, that young dogs in the stage one are only lame for a few seconds. There really is a purely inflammatory disease at that stage. It's acute pain, it's not chronic pain. They have a normal body, they just have a slight imperfection in their joints. At stage two, it's a young adult that will really have clinical signs that follow intense exercise, that's a weekend warrior syndrome, that's the Monday lameness, if you want, or Sunday night lameness. That's the second stage of the disease, often with osteoarthritis, that will go on until midlife or so, maybe five, six years of age, at which point dogs are going to arrive at stage three, where they become exercise intolerant. They say, I've been in pain every Sunday night for the last four years, and now enough is enough. You know, they're losing strength a little, their joint is getting thicker, the degeneration has set in, and they are now at that third stage of disease often. And unfortunately, osteoarthritis is diagnosed at that third stage when it should be diagnosed at the first and the second stage. We would do a better job. And then the fourth stage, which is that terminal stage, dogs can't move anymore, they can't get up. They have lost so much strength, they have so much chronic pain that they make the decision they can't, they don't want, to get up, and often that's the end of their life. And we should never get to stage four. If we manage degenerative joint disease appropriately, we'll never reach that point. That is our goal. Remember, owner is concerned about these things, not the cartilage thickness. So, in conclusion, inflammation and degeneration are completely intertwined in osteoarthritis, even though some diseases are more inflammatory early on and tend to be diagnosed more readily. Other diseases are less inflammatory, like hip dysplasia, and may be diagnosed years later. Uh, they still will combine both inflammation and degeneration. Thank you. Great. If you can stay here for a little bit longer, because uh, we have a question and answer session. Uh, it's not after every speaker, but I'll let you know, but we have five minutes for questions uh, after this wonderful lecture. And the one thing that I got out of this, which is always a major eye-opener for myself, is next time when I go to the doctor, I just scream. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Exactly. All right, any questions from the audience? And I want to explain, we have audience questions. We'll get you the microphone. Please uh, speak clearly. We have our digital team there, and maybe we should give them a hand because they're on the computer all the time. So there they are, my four stars. And if you don't want to ask your question yourself, you can also do it through the app. And we have two people watching the apps for questions too. So uh, either three of those uh, options. So any questions from the audience? 
Any questions from the world and any questions from the app? Yeah, All right, we have um, a That was a great presentation. I always enjoy listening to you talk. Um, the real question, I guess, from the nutrition uh, angle is that uh, you have that six-month-old German Shepherd, Golden Retriever that comes in with, uh, you know, the radiographic evidence of maybe some uh, hip dysplasia or uh, elbow dysplasia or both. Um, do you transition those dogs once they're adults to a, we'll call it, a joint protective type of a diet, or do you wait for clinical signs? What's what's the general mantra? Well, I, um, that's an excellent question. We have the opportunity to protect joints. You know, nutrition, and I think we'll uh, hear about that during the day, nu you know, the part of the lecture that stops a little bit abruptly is where do we go from there, and, and your question is excellent. It's very logical to, to give them information, to give owners information that will cover our lifetime. I work really hard to say, let's not be too worried about the next three days, even though it's important to, to, to take early steps, but let's look at things over the long term. So if a strategy can help patients over a long term, like a nutritional strategy, then it, it must be at the top of the list because there are not that many things that can help over a lifetime. So the answer is yes, absolutely. It has to be presented to owners as a very logical thing to do to adopt as a long-term strategy that can have an impact over a lifetime. And we love the yes answer. So that's a great answer. Any no other questions? questions? Oh, Amy has a question. I was wondering, in general practice, when we're not necessarily performing radiographs on every dog that's arthritic, mm -hmm. um, how much, uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the um, common clinical signs that we can be doing in a general practice, range of motion um, versus crepitus in a joint versus just um, maybe a swelling or extra bone growth, things that we can feel and see Absolutely. and how much to prioritize what's the most significant findings? And that's an excellent question that relates to, hey, what can we do if we don't have radiographs or don't want to do whole body radiographs on every dog? That's unrealistic. And so the answer is we can do a lot. And I think the first thing we need to do is to pay very close attention to any little hint from an owner. Because owners will give hints but we tend to, you know, it's busy day and so on. So we got to do a very good job in letting, giving them the opportunity to voice their opinion about what might be abnormal. They see things that we don't see. They, if anything is out of the ordinary in how a dog lays down, how they get up and how they move, you should give them the opportunity to let you know. And that can be done with a questionnaire right as they wait for the visit. So you don't have to actually extract that information from them when you see them. Then watching the dog is very important. Also changing position, moving. I'm talking about 10 seconds. 10 seconds of observation will go a long way. Listening to the owner, observing the dog, and then a minute palpating these limbs will go a long way also. If you want to be very specific, then you will look at flexion and extension of these six joints on both sides. That's 12 joints. In five seconds for each joint, that you have filled a minute that will be tremendously helpful. Puppies should not be painful. Now puppies are all crazy and you've got to be able to differentiate lack of patience from pain, but it's, it's fairly easy to do if you repeat something. But spending that minute flexing and extending all joints, and, and when it rains, it pours. If an elbow hurts, it might be swollen also with elbow dysplasia. But the first thing you're going to screen for is a pain response to palpation. Then you look for crepitus, effusion, and maybe an abnormal flexion and extension. And, you know, your, your exam can become a little bit more precise if you and go from And although this was a great question, M Dr. Marcelin is going wild with this question, but I need to cut him off. I'm sorry, but Thank because uh, we have five minutes, but if you have more questions, please uh, uh, save them for our panel discussion later, and, uh, and there all our speakers will be back. So I want to have a huge hand of applause Thank for you. Dr. Martin later. Perfectly done.